Walker and I'm with the Austin chapter of the Texas Cobra Club. Uh, it's Saturday morning, or excuse me, Friday morning. The weather's turned good for us. There's a whole bunch of people that are heading out to the Oasis restaurant now. There are several that are heading out to do the uh, Operation Comfort uh, Road Rally, which is sort of like a scavenger hunt to go collect points for prizes. There's money being raised for Operation Comfort, which is a rehabilitation uh, division of the Brook Army Medical Center down in San Antonio. And we're helping soldiers build their garage. It's called Auto Motivation. Um, we're expecting another probably 30 or 40 cars to come in right now, and uh, we're just waiting for a wonderful event to stick in. Yeah, this is the uh, Texas Cobra Club's 10th annual spring meet. Now, there are chapters in Dallas, in Houston, and Austin, San Antonio, but we're drawing cars from Oklahoma and Arkansas as far over as uh, Monroe, Louisiana, New Orleans, Louisiana. Uh, we have a, one car that was shipped over from Hawaii, not for the event, but he's going to be here later today. Uh, and so we've got, uh, we've got about 125 to 130 cars. Uh, each year the, the event gets larger and larger. Uh, this year is our first time to have it in San Marcos because of the, the hotel location. And one of the features we had this year is here in San Marcos we had the commemorative uh, Air Force, which is a collection of World War II uh, aircraft, including the B-25 Yellow Rose uh, bomber, uh, as well as a P-39 Air Cobra. And the, the guys out there at the airport are pulling one of the Air Cobras out onto the, uh, onto the ramp and allowing us to uh, have photographs made with a Cobra with a Cobra. And we think that's going to be a great draw for them and, uh, and really support the, uh, the museum that's out at uh, the San Marcos Airport. And they're going to have a 60 million dollars Really? Yeah, if uh, you'd like to learn more about what's going on with the Texas Cobra Club, we have several ways. Clubcobra.com is our most active site, and there's a forum that's dedicated to the Texas Cobra Club, as well as under the Yahoo groups, uh, the Austin Cobra Club and the Houston Cobra Club both have uh, user groups in there, and that's sort of our daily communication. Uh, this event is uh, set up under TexasCobraMeet.com, but it's just dedicated to this site for registration, hotel information, directions, and things like that. We'll be using that site from, from year to year as, we, uh, as this uh, event grows. The 10th Anniversary Cobra Club Meet of Texas is now underway and it's time to get in the car and ride. Now we hit the open road with the group of Cobras. All the Cobra members all share the excitement of the Cobra experience. The Cobra experience, well, it's a combination of many things. It's the sense of freedom one feels with the loud noise of the rumbling motor, the wind blowing in your face, and knowing you can outperform and pass any car on the road. It's the racing heritage of Shelby Cobra and how it beat Ferrari. Now the Cobras are entering the historic town of Green. Green has been designated a historic town by the state of Texas. The name of the town is pronounced like the color green. Henry D. Green, the town's founder, originally bought land for a cotton farm in 1872 with his father and brothers. He built his first home in 1872 and modified it over the years. It still stands proudly with the Victorian galleries today as the Green Mansion Inn. It is listed on the National Register of Historic Places and is a designated Texas Historic Landmark. Standing high above the town buildings, the Green Water Tower is a beacon for miles around to all visitors coming to Historic Green for another entertaining visit. Whether you are a weekender or in town for a week or longer, Green is a wonderful happening for all. Visitors from far and near love the town of Green so much that they keep coming back every chance they get and the Cobra Club's been here before. No matter what your desires are, you are only moments away from shopping, eating, wine tasting, tubbing, dancing, and lodging in just about any direction. From historic green, Austin is 40 miles to the north, San Antonio is 25 miles to the south, and Houston is 160 miles to the east. New Braunfels and Canyon Lake 
are only minutes away. The first Mercantile store was built by H.D. Green in 1878 to serve the local cotton farmers and travelers who passed through the area. David Kidwell pulls in his Cobra. At the restaurant, he had hit a low curb and broken a piece of his front end off, so he gets out to inspect the damage. It looks like the bottom half of the large oval air intake has come completely off. Products is headquartered in New Braunfels, Texas, with more than 80,000 square feet of manufacturing and wholesale space. Many of our restraints, helmets, and flagship parachutes are manufactured and tested right here. Some of the milestones in 2008 were Simpson introduced the Double Ray Super Light Carbon Fiber Helmet. Simpson introduces the Mercury Drag Helmet. Simpson also employs the largest customer service and sales team devoted solely to servicing NASCAR customers of any racing safety supplier. have another group coming in as our group heads back to the hotel. David, how are you feeling about your car now? I feel great, believe it or not. I really do. It didn't ruin my day or my week or my month. So we're good to go. I needed to work on that panel anyway. That panel had some problems, and I was wondering how I was going to get to it. Now I know. You can see the flames coming out of David's side pipes.
Jake's explaining to Jay what happened to his cobra. We didn't know it was happening. I saw this thing fly up like this. And I knew we were done. Jody Orsag's cobra got a scrape. My name is Alfredo Canalizo. This is my car. It's a, a 427 Kirkham replica. It has a 482 engine. Uh, it has like a 700 horsepower. Uh, it uh, finishes aluminum. It's a Polish aluminum, natural, with the sand stripes. And it has independent suspension in the rear, the 15 wheels, a stainless steel side pipes. And, uh, has my business is in Mexico. I sell these cars in Mexico City. I'm a dealer from Kirkham, and uh, this is a 427 SC replica. A car like this, it's uh, around the 100,000 and 120,000 with the same options. And my webpage is kitcarsmexico.com, and my name is Alfredo Canalis. My name is Bill Boker. This is a Mid-States uh, replica. Uh, the number 55 was an actual race car that was used back in 66. And, uh, I wanted to replicate it with decals, engine with the two fours, the 427, everything just like it was. The car is almost exact except the, uh, the tread width is about an inch too wide, but the height, the weight, everything else is identical to what it was when it was built. On your decal packages, uh, some decals they're still making, some they're not. The winds friction proofing decal is hard to get. The SO decal, which is now in co, it was humble years ago. That decal uh, is is pretty rare. The Kono shocks you can still get in a good year. The Autolite spark plug, the white Autolite spark plug decal like that, it's not as rare, but you don't find them every day. My name is James Yell. I'm with Radical Roaches of Texas. I'm the Backdraft Racing Cobra Replica dealer for the southwest part of the country. And uh, these are some of the examples of some of the fine Backdraft Racing Cobras that are made. Radical Roasters can sell the Cobras as a rolling chassis. They're actually built from Backdraft as a rolling chassis. They're complete. They're painted. The interior is done. The suspension, the frame. They're completely completed cars except for the minus the engine and transmission. And uh, basically here at Radical Roasters we can either sell you the car that way and a customer can can install them themselves or we can actually order you a crate engine and install it with a transmission get everything running so all you gotta do is put the key in and drive out um, I'm a Roush racing dealer I'm also a Keith Craft racing dealer uh, also a Ford racing dealer so we can get any kind of motor that you're looking for and basically any combination to fit anyone's personal needs on what they're looking to spend and what they're looking to accomplish in a Cobra replica the backdraft racing Cobras one of the really unique parts about the Backdraft Racing Cobras, one of the biggest things is they are built in a factory, so they're all built to certain factory standards, so they're all built the same, which is very important. 
And one of the most important things is, is they all use BMW suspension. And the BMW suspension is second to none. It's been great in race cars. It works terrific in the Cobra replicas. And we've had great success with it. And it's doing really well, especially with the BMW independent rear suspension. It's just a super strong suspension that has great comfort and ride, but a super sporty feel. You can take one of these cars in bone stock uh, condition and actually drive it on the street, or you can actually take it and drive it on the track, which is one of the really nice things about the car. But they're fantastic products, they're built very well, and uh, we'd be happy to help any customers that are looking for them. The easiest way to get in touch with uh, me would be uh, www.radicalroadsters, that's radicalroadsters with a S, dot com, and uh, we'd be happy to help you out. Hi, my name is Brian Alexander and I'm the owner of Lone Star Classics. We're based out of Fort Worth, Texas. And uh, with this particular car, we wanted to, to build a demo that was uh, something that stood out and really got a lot of attention. Uh, but this is real fun, this particular car. It's, uh, it's with the snake eyes, with the fangs, and the bright colors. And one big thing that we did with this car was to eliminate all of the chrome. There's absolutely no chrome in this car whatsoever. Uh, we went to great lengths to, to powder coat everything uh, flat black and this, even the stripes and the paint are all flat black. And uh, we went with the Kawasaki green uh, you know, color and um, it's really got a lot of attention. It's different than what you typically see and, and I just haven't you know, really had one that's, that's been me. And this one is more personalized than any car I've ever, I've ever built before. Well, the history of the company started in 1991 uh, when um, a couple guys started a company that began as a hobby and um, I came on board with the company in uh, 1998 at which point the, you know, the company had, was starting to grow, just moved into a new facility and, uh, and I, I, I noticed that there was a lot of things they were doing, it was in the dark ages, you know, they weren't taking credit cards, they weren't doing this and that, no website. So I took the company to another level and then uh, 10 years later I was given the opportunity to, 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 to take ownership of the company by you know, buying it. So I bought the, the owner out and uh, ever since we've started evolving the product in, in, in ways that the previous owner wasn't willing to. And we've really taken the car to another level. And, uh, and we've been you know, offering new services now that, like I was mentioning before, that has been, have been getting a lot of uh, media coverage and things in the magazines. Uh, things that at first almost seem unbelievable. Uh, like you know, us going to people's homes and building cars with them in their garage using our tools in seven days. You know, that's just something that people are like, at first, you know, can you, is that possible? And they're like, well, we've done it 40 times. So, yeah, it's possible. And so you know, people can go to our website and watch videos of that because uh, we time lapse most all of our builds. Um, you know, our product is something that's geared up for the taller gentleman. I mean, obviously, I'm six foot two. Uh, most of my customers are tall, uh, but you don't have to be tall to drive one of our cars because they do have seat adjustments. But, but it's it's important that you feel comfortable in the car, and that uh, you know that, that when you drive the car, you feel like you're in your regular day-to-day -day driver. Um, and, and you know, Lone Stars is a, they're a kit that you don't see for sale very often. I mean, it's very difficult to find them for sale, and that really speaks volumes for the product. You know, if people aren't willing to get rid of them. It's, there's a good reason. Um, the, uh, the Lone Star is stretched four inches in the cockpit uh, from, the, you know, from the original specs. And uh, we, didn't, with, we didn't widen the car, uh, we just made it four inches longer. And it's very difficult to, to notice that by looking at it. But when you get in it, it's a huge difference and you know, you'll really feel the difference. When, yeah, and when I was in high school, my favorite car was a Cobra replica. And I used to look at them in magazines and, and just drool. And you know, dream of someday of getting a job where I could make enough money to be able to buy one. And um, whenever uh, you know, I started working at the company, which was a dream come true already, um, you know, that, was, that put me in the, behind the driver's seat, that allowed me to get on, on the cover of some magazines. That was neat. Um, and then uh, you know, taking ownership of the company, of course, put me in a position where I can build any of them that I like for myself. But obviously, we use those for demo purposes. Well, you know, our seven-day build is very unique to the industry, uh, mainly because uh, it's something that you know, no one's ever heard of. Um, you know, there, there are situations where people can buy kits from companies and have them built uh, and then delivered to their door. Uh, but th we found that there's a lot of situations where people you know, want to be involved with the build, but they may feel that they are a little overwhelmed with it. They don't have a lot of automotive experience. So this is a program that's really fun that allows them the opportunity to, to, have, to have their cake and eat it too, basically. I mean, you, they can ha have their hands on the car, know every part about it, 
and at the end of the build, you know, have the satisfaction of having built a car, but it's, you know, we assisted, of course. They assisted us, and we got it done in seven days. Um, but this industry uh, has never done anything like that before. That's very revolutionary for it. Um, you know, we did offer a program years ago where we, built a, where we would build a car with you in, at our facility in 10 days. That got a lot of coverage back then and a lot, a lot of attention, and we've just evolved it since then. So now it's even more convenient. So this is a good investment. I mean, it's something that you can build, and when you have it finished, it's worth more than it was when you, before you started. Uh, for information about our products, uh, you can visit our website. That's the best source of information. It's uh, www.lonestarclassics.com. So it's easy to remember just the name of the company, .com. We have a lot of customers here, and this is a great opportunity for the company to mingle with the customers, and uh, especially with our seven-day build, which a lot of customers here have participated in that. I'm also kind of proud to say that uh, the majority of the manufactured cars here are Lone Star Classic vehicles. My name is Larry Rayburn. I've got a uh, 1965 Daytona Coupe replica. It's actually a Factory 5 model. It's a kit car. It was built in 1960, uh, or, I'm sorry, 2004 by a fellow in uh, Houston, Texas who works for NASA. And uh, the original cars, there were six of them built to uh, beat Ferrari in the FIA championship over in Europe. The Cobra, which you see a lot of around here, didn't have the aerodynamics to uh, pick up the speed on the long straightaways. So Peter Brock, who was part of Shelby's American team at that point in time, designed this car. It's called the Cam Body, K-A-M. And it was uh, uh, an ugly thing to begin with. And then when they started winning races, everybody fell in love with it. They built six of them. And they ran for about a year and a half. They won in Sebring, and they won at uh, Le Mans, and they won the FIA championship in 1965, 66 area. And then the Ford came out with the GT40, and that made this car obsolete. Today, in fact, next month in May, they have one of the originals that is going to go on the auction block in Indianapolis or in Indiana, and the starting bid is $10 million. So from a crummy little uh, sports car to a, a masterpiece of, uh, of mechanical genius by a fellow by the name of Peter Brock and Carroll Shelby. My first uh, introduction to the Cobra was in 1963. I went to a sports car race uh, that was sanctioned by USRRC, United States Road Racing Championship, and I met Carol Shelby and Ken Miles and a few of the other guys that were on the original Shelby American team. They were traveling the United States trying to kick uh, Corvette's butt, and I saw my first Cobra, and I thought someday, I was 20 years old at the time, I said someday somewhere I'm going to have one of those, and I'm going to go sports car racing. Well, when I turned 56 years old, I bought a Formula V open wheel sports car, joined SCCA, and went racing for 10 years. And then I got too old to fit my fat body into that little cigar, sold it, and decided it was time to buy a Cobra. There's so many Cobras, I mean, there's very few of them on the road, but there's so many of them at a, at a meet like this, you'll only see one or two Daytona Coupes. And I thought, I want to be just a little bit different, so I found this Daytona for sale. It was reasonable and uh, I plunked my money down and bought it and been happy ever since. I did put air conditioning in it and carpet it and uh, some dynamat to make the sound a little bit uh, less deafening inside. A friend of mine that gave him a ride in, he says, Larry, he says, riding in this car is like riding inside of a speaker. <laughs> it was really loud. So I had it carpeted and put in some uh, uh, air conditioning and now my wife will uh, ride with me in it. The original Daytona Coupes had a uh, 289 in them, and uh, they generated, I think, in the neighborhood of around 280 horsepower, and they would hit almost 200 miles an hour down the Molesane Strait. This car has a Ford 302 Cobra jet engine that I've had enhanced by Keith Craft Motors. He put an AFR aluminum head, uh, Edelbrock Performer 2 headers on it, new injectors. It's a fuel-injected car. and. Um, it has 300 horsepower at the rear wheel, according to their dyno. We uh, take them every year to an uh, uh, event called Run and Gun up in St. Louis at Gateway International Raceway. And last year, coming down the front straightaway after slamming it through the uh, fourth turn as fast as I dared go, they had us, uh, they had us clocked at about 140 miles an hour with a uh, radar gun. So I was uh, petrified going into turn one, but made it uh, to speak here today. <laughs> 
the uh, original purchase price was a very fair price, and uh, today the uh, vehicle probably would sell for a neighborhood of forty-five to sixty thousand dollars, depending upon the uh, market and the economy. So I usually take it out uh, two or three times a month to a car event, either with the Cobra Club or some other car event. And occasionally I'll take it to the ice cream store, up to the grocery store, but usually I don't like to leave it un unattended in a uh, parking lot because you can't lock them up. The first time that I had it out in public, a fellow came up and he said, Hey Larry, that's really a nice Datsun you got out there. And I says, get out of here. People have called it Corvettes. They're not sure what kind of a Corvette it is. So I have to tell them a little bit about the history of the car and a little bit about the car. It's, and it's, it'll turn heads, children drop their jaws, mothers grab their children and point. And when you're driving down the highway, people will slow down and grab their cameras or their, tell their cell phone and shoot pictures. It's, it's comical to watch people come up real fast and then almost stop right beside you to take a picture. You know, there's a Ferrari dealer right around the corner from where we live. And I've often thought about going over there and uh, parking the car out front of his showroom. Yes, did John. You, did you tell him this car is for sale? No, I didn't. I didn't say that. <laughs> this car is for sale. I learned in New York when I was living up there that everything is for sale. <laughs> Except my wife. <laughs>
uh, 427s. We try to use an aluminum big block because they're lighter, about 100 pounds lighter. The motor on this car has been moved back 10 inches from the originals uh, to get better weight distribution. And uh, they, they end up with about 50-50 uh, on each wheel, which uh, is good, better for braking and, and accelerating. And uh, then what we did, we put in uh, a steel uh, chest, a steel uh, roll cage assembly. So they've got two by four steel beams in the uh, in the doors. They got a front hoop that goes around that holds the windshield, and a rear hoop that goes around behind the driver that holds the uh, crash barrel rollover bar. That way. You're not hooking onto the fiberglass something. The thing hooks right onto the chassis. No, the, the reason that I built it was when Aunt started building these things originally, and he was the one that picked up uh, using those two items because the, the one reason for the, for the uh, MGB front end, it was an integral unit that unbolted with four bolts so that all the geometry was correct. And then on the same with the Jag, they could just unbolt the Jag, come out with three big bolts on it, bolts it in the Jag car, and we just take it out of the Jag and drop it in underneath, and all the geometry is correct. So you don't have to go through re-engineering the suspension for it. Kirkham, Kirkham, uh, in Kirkham Brothers in uh, Salt Lake City, they, they copied the original one. They, they were like a four, the, the, four, the 289 was a three inch tube, and the 427 was a four inch tube, with a crisscross uh, front and rear, uh, you call it, uh, support that holds the suspension. Um, they have an aluminum body and they, they're built in Poland. Uh, they took over a MiG factory after the war and uh, where they were building airplanes and then they, they started building these Cobras in the, in the original thing. They increased the thickness of the aluminum from 50,000 to 60,000, they're a little bit stronger. On the original ones, when you're working on them, if you drop your elbows on the car, you dent them. They were so soft and thin. You know, and then every time if they got crashed or anything, what you what you did was uh, you'd have to pick and file a thing, and because they got thinner and thinner and thinner. Well, it depends on what you're looking for. Auth authenticity is it's the it's the it's the right way to do it because that's the way they were. But in the, in the case of this it's this car here, uh, it's a it's three times stronger torsional rigidity in the chassis than the original ones. The chassis only had two four-inch tube with three cross braces, so when you went into a corner, the car twisted. But with those old-fashioned tires and the, roll, and, the, and the round tires they had, the thing rolled in and it worked like hell. It worked good. They won the World Manufacturers Championship over Ferrari. If you're looking for, uh, as far as the Cobra's concerned, if you want authenticity, then the Kirkham is probably the best one on the market right now. Uh, they are built with the same uh, four-inch tube with the three cross braces, the crisscross on the front and rear suspension. Uh, to support the wheels and uh, they got aluminum body which is the way they are uh, but those twisted a lot during during r racing and but in the old days we had these round sort of tires the Goodyear blue streak tires and they rolled with the punches and they worked pretty good now today what we're doing is we're making the chassis a lot stiffer uh, they're three times stronger ro torsional rigidity and they probably handle a little bit better than what the older ones did but it depends on what you want, you know. I, I prefer to see uh, the, the more originality in it. If you look, a lot of these, they don't have the correct uh, exhaust pipes on them, for instance. They had uh, two-inch primaries that went down and they necked down into a, what we call a crown, and they went into, into a straight pipe from there. Now, what you see now on most of these cars, they're little tubes that are squashed down together and welded on, and they just don't look like the originals. Well, you know, it's been so long, it's been, it's probably 15 years since I was building these things now. And back then, it was the three top cars. It was ERA, Contemporary Classic, and, and ours, the Butler. And they were very similar. And uh, both of those had uh, a, st a stiffer chassis than what. But the difference between the Butler is, is uh, most of the others didn't have a crash protection in it. Now, the Butler has a uh, roll hoop that goes over the front, uh, across your front of your feet. It holds the windshield and the steering column. In behind it, it has a steel hoop that goes across behind the seats that the roll bar is actually welded to or bolted onto. And then it has door guard beams that are two by four steel, weight to wall steel that goes in the door. So if you hit something side on with the thing, you've got crash protection in the side. With most of these others, uh, I think, are just fiberglass with a piece of eighth inch plate uh, 
glued onto the fiberglass with a hinge on it. So if you hit something, the thing just collapses. So that was one of the reasons that, uh, that this was done, for safety. And what a beautiful day it's been. And with the sun setting low on this first day of the 10th anniversary Texas Cobra Club meet, everyone's ready for some steak dinner and to share in their Cobra experiences. And as night falls, the party continues. Doesn't get any better than this with Cobra Club members enjoying being with one another. As some Cobra owners get their cars ready for the night, others are not quite through, relaxing and talking about their cars or the day's events, and excited of what day number two holds. Welcome to day number two of the 10th anniversary Cobra Club meet. We had some rain last night, so the car owners are getting their cars cleaned up and ready for the ride. The weather looks good this afternoon, so it's going to be sunny and windy. There's Jay Nordstrom in his 57 Chevy golf cart. Jay told me that thing would go over 100 miles an hour. So we're getting ready for day number two, an exciting day where the Cobras are going to go out to the San Marcos Airport and have their picture taken with a Cobra aircraft. So let's get started. Jason Smith and uh, worked for Ron Butler from about 1990 to 1994 and uh, we built, uh, that was during his busy time in Santa Barbara and we built a couple dozen cars during that time in various, various stages from simple kits to complete turnkeys and uh, this car is one of the turnkeys that, uh, that went out during that time. <clears throat> the Butler cars have, a, uh, have an engine setback of about 8 inches or so from this particular car is an uh, all aluminum dove motor, uh, 488 stroker. Uh, this has uh, uh, the stack fuel injection on it, uh, dry sump boiling system. Uh, also has young blood 17 inch wheels. Um, most noticeable thing uh, in the Butlers is the large transmission tunnel. Uh, and that's to accommodate the transmission and bell housing because of the engine setback. Um, the dashboard is a little bit more compact because of that. And uh, also another feature of these cars is the steering column is raised a couple inches over the original cars. And uh, that's to accommodate a little bit taller people. There's a little bit more leg room. And uh, also allows for the more compact dash. The Butlers all had welded stainless steel tanks. Uh, this one is a little bit different than most of them. Um, it's been a little bit more fit to the trunk. Um, and it's also, which you can't see, it's got a, uh, a cutout on the underside of it to accommodate the Halibrand rear suspension that's in this particular car. This is the only Butler that was ever built with the Halibrand quick change independent rear suspension. It was originally developed for racing um, to allow you to the, change the gears at the track very quickly. You can actually just pull the rear cover off and pull two gears out and change them and change your rear axle ratio. It's, it's a really good feeling, especially this car, because this car was a very special car. Um, 
that Ron Butler worked on. I did a lot of work on it, and it's, it's great to see it. It's been uh, about 15 years since it was built, and it's been almost that long since I've seen it. The biggest option in this car, and only in this car, was the, the Halibrand rear end. Um, some of the smaller options that are similar to other manufacturers uh, would be the roll bar, chrome, um, the fuel filler cap, it's a Le Mans style fuel filler cap, uh, front and rear bumpers, this car actually has overriders in the front, but the full rear bumper uh, instead of quick jacks or just overriders. 17-inch Youngblood wheels and tires uh, were optional. These are about as big as they get. I believe they're 335s on the rear and, and 275s on the front. Gorgeous paint job. Um, at the time I was there at Butler, uh, most of the cars that we built were set up for Ford V8s or had them installed. Um, a lot of the earlier cars were set up for Chevys, and the car could be ordered um, back to the option thing. The car could be ordered with big or small block Chevy or Ford V8. Uh, your, your choice of uh, anything from four-speed top loader to a T10 um, to a Doug Nash five-speed, which is what this car has, or uh, later on. Tremec five speeds, which we installed quite a few cars also. Ron Butler stopped uh, around the mid 90s. Um, he built a total of 104 cars between about 1980 and about 1996. And uh, then shut down his operation. My name is Don Triola. Uh, this is my super performance. I got it because of the fit and finish and one of the better replicas on the market. RDI built 460 Ford engine. It's uh, like 425 at the rear wheels, 450 torque at the rear wheels, which equates out to about 550 at the motor. My name is Roger Sturgill, and uh, I have a classic Roadster. Completed it in 2002. I put all of that stuff in myself. Uh, I just covered the dash and everything. And my wheels I got from my wife. That's a 302 90 model Mustang motor. Got uh, E303 cam, roller rocker. I've got aluminum rims, you know, and the aluminum about every two or three months I'm calling. How are you?
was Jonathan Kidwell telling me that the cars we are following don't seem to have a clue on where the Mexican restaurant is. My name is Joachim Clea and this is a backdraft racing uh, Cobra. The engine, it's a 351 Windsor uh, Ford Racing Crate engine with a mass flow uh, fuel injection uh, setup. It's got GT40 aluminum heads. It's got a slight little, you know, a little cam action going and it's got a Tramec uh, five-speed transmission and it just runs great for this light of a car. I'm John Woody. I have one of 39 of the Factory 5 Racing GT Spiders. Uh, this is uh, one of two in Texas. Uh, I've just completed it. It's got about 150 miles on it. This is the first time I've been to a uh, uh, one of the meetings. This is this is a, a an open cockpit version of the Daytona Coupe. It uh, the whole front end opens up. It's got a uh, uh, 302 GT40 engine, uh, five-speed transmission, independent rear suspension, uh, and it's essentially brand new. It's a work in progress right now. The Spider is essentially an open cockpit uh, Daytona Coupe. Uh, Factory 5 uh, did 39 of them, and then they got uh, old to another project, and so they didn't go any further with it. We're kind of an orphan group.
climbing did you? Oh, no. Oh. Okay. Oh. the speed limit, did you? Not yet. <laughs> That's good. <laughs> How are you again? I'm good. And, and y'all didn't go over the speed limit, right? No. No, no, no one here has. It's funny. <laughs> no one. <laughs> Now the photographers, in order to get this group shot of all the Cobras with the aircraft Cobra, had a scissor lift elevator that would take them up extremely high to get the shot. Well I went up there to get the video shot and boy what a mistake that was. I thought I was going to die. Okay. I'm gonna die up here, damn it. <laughs> okay. Thanks, thank you, Kim. <laughs> yeah. Oh, wait. Are they gonna be Okay, we can live from this part. Of it. This guy's used to doing this. I'm not. Yeah. And then we're gonna go up high again Okay, get ready for this real big jerk. I was able to get the shot that I needed and then I told him, take me down, because the photographers wanted to move it around a little bit more, but I wasn't gonna have any of that. I'm telling you, this thing was so unstable, uh, I'm really surprised that it didn't fall over and kill all of us. it was and no stabilization on the bottom finally he put out uh, the stabilizers to make it safe for the people on there bigger than tomorrow we'll check out and we gotta we gotta be home at a certain time we got time
now that we got the Cobra group picture done, it's time to head out into the hill country. My name is Jack Maidley. This is my Lone Star Cobra. It's got a 408 Keithcraft Stroker. 
I built it uh, starting in July 2005 and finished getting it painted uh, this last fall and I love it. Wonderful day being able to ride in the Cobra through the hill country. Coming back to home base here where the sun is setting low and seeing all the beautiful Cobras one more time. We have to say that coming to the Texas Annual Cobra Club meet 10th anniversary was quite a treat. You know, uh, it was a long time ago, but uh, I was working with Ken Miles out at Riverside for, before he got killed, and uh, it was kind of unique for me because uh, I was his mechanic, and at the end of the day, after about uh, working, changing all the stuff on the car for him, he'd let me have four or five laps around Riverside, for instance, and, uh, and uh, one of the times I crashed the car, <laughs> that's probably what ruined my, my uh, chances of being a team driver, but... Uh, he, he was going around Riverside in a minute 37, and I could go around Riverside in a minute 37 and a half. And I thought, if I can just get that last half a second, I'll be as good as Ken Miles, you know. So I was trying around to come through turn six, and I went into over seven, and I went over the top, and I went too fast, and uh, all four wheels come off the ground. I hit the brakes, and of course, they didn't work. Ran into the bank, and the whole thing smashed the right front wheel back up into the oil pump, and dust and oil went everywhere. So I was... Uh, I thought, geez, I better get this back to the shop before Carol, Carol finds out. And I was uh, 
working on the car underneath the front wheel, and I turned around and I looked, and I see these two Texan boots standing there. <laughs> and uh, it was Carol, Carol Shelby, and, uh, and he looked at me, he says, where are you working next week, boy? <laughs> <laughs> my son drove the thing. They had a run gun one time, and uh, my son actually drove it. And so I don't really know. I can't really tell you what the difference was. But they, they I think they stopped better. We had a test one time at, at a road, at a, I think it was a road and track, and they had an ERA and a contemporary crash canal. And they had a braking test, and from uh, from 60 mile to zero, one stopped in 145, one stopped in 155, and now stopped in 120 feet, which was so much better. And one of the reasons I think is because of the wider tires on the front, and then the brake and the balance, because we've moved the motor back 10 inches in the frame, which gives you like 50, 50 percent uh, with with a with a small lock, and actually 52 percent on the rear wheels with a with a small lock Ford, like a 351 window is what we usually use. So I think that in that way it actually stopped better. As far as the handling is concerned, uh, the, the other thing about this car is I think they're more usable, user friendly. Uh, these other guys showed up with the car and they had all great huge horsepower, 427 with a lot of horsepower, and then they come out there and the, the hood wouldn't fit on the car because they didn't, they, the motor was sticking out of the top, so they had to run it without the hood. The first first bus they made, they slipped the clutch out of it. So they didn't get the run, you know. So the, 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 I think the thing is to have a usable car that you can drive every day and it's reliable. You don't need 600 horsepower. I mean, 400 horsepower is more than you need. You know, I, I don't know enough about the the people that are building today. You know, uh, I would think from if if I was going to buy buy a Cobra, I think I'd probably buy a Kirkham. You know, with a, with a, if I, I would go for more for originality than all this stuff because you want something that looks right that looks, looks the part and has all the little, little uh, tiny uh, subtle changes and stuff that, uh, that it's supposed to have. You know, they got all these aftermarket wheels on these things and I, I mean, they, they look like pimp mobiles with most of them, you know, I just don't like that. I like the original stuff. Living in Hawaii, actually, to, to, to go back to the real beginning, racing an MGA out on the Kahuku Air, Airstrip. And uh, uh, I was racing against a guy called Al Dowd that uh, was running an Aston Martin, one of those uh, DV, uh, little, the small ones that looked like the forerunner to the Cobra. And uh, he, he, I used to help him with his me mechanics and stuff on it. Then I, he came back to the States and started working for Shelby as a parts, as a parts cleaner. I went back to New Zealand and I bought a 59 GT Carrera and I, I raced that in New Zealand for four years. And about 1963, they started, these Cobras started beating the Corvettes and they were like, wait, 2,200 pounds, they had the 289 motor in them and they were hauling ass, they had Davey McDonald driving and a few guys there and they were beating the Corvettes. So things got so busy that he called me in New Zealand and asked me if I would come over and start working for him. So I, I dropped everything in three weeks, I sold every damn thing I had and came over here and started working to him and uh, when I walked in the shop and I saw all this uh, dyno and they're running the motor at 75, up, 100 RPM and the windows are all shaking and uh, I saw, looked on the ground there's two tires sitting there and they're 12 inches wide. I, I'd never seen the tire that big. The biggest one I'd seen was a 616. And, and any anyway, rate, uh, I went down and saw the, uh, the heliarch welders and stuff like that. And Jesus, I, I turned Al down. I said, man, I can't do this. This is this way over my head. He's, ah, oh, you'll pick it up. I'll give you a picture with old Granny Collins. Well, John Collins was, uh, they called him Granny because he was an old woman, you know. <laughs> but he was a good fabricator and uh, he took me under his wing and, and sort of taught me what I need to know. And then the first week I was sent to NASA to, uh, with Charlie Agapu to race at NASA Speed Week. And, uh, we went over there and uh, the first thing that happened, we went out and practice that and we run a bearing in the engine. So they flew uh, John Holman with another engine over to, to NASA and we had to change the engine. And, and, when, and when Holman looked at the motor, we got chewed out because we'd built the oil pan the wrong way. When you, when you put a wider pan on the bottom, you, uh, you, you have to weld the, the two pieces together. Like we'd welded them sideways at the top. And when you do that, the, the little blue pieces of uh, oxidization uh, after the motor starts to vibrate, it drops down, gets in the oil, and then run the bearings. So anyway, we, we put the new, uh, the new uh, uh, motor in the car, went out and uh, started running the practice, and everything was okay. So we were, we were stationed in a great big hangar at the airport, and we weren't allowed to work on the cars for some reason. I think this might be a NASCAR rule. We weren't allowed to work on the cars for till uh, till after five o'clock at night, 
So they said, well, we, we, um, we can't uh, let you stay here. We're going to get a police guy to look after the shop and lock it up. Nobody's going to come in here. So they got, uh, I got this, uh, and then when we, when we got to leave, Al Dowd said to me, well, you better disconnect the batteries. And I said, well, why not? He said, do what you're told and just get the thing battery. I said, nobody's going to see it. You know, anyway, I disconnected the batteries. And uh, we went home, and the next morning we come in at 7 o'clock, and there was police all around the place, and the, the big uh, black guy that was standing there with a 30, 300-pound guy with a gun and shit, he was sitting on the floor against the wall with a bottle in his hand, and he'd got drunk and gone in and turned the keys on and started every one of these cars he couldn't and stood on the floor until they blew up. And I come in there, and the Penske two, car, two cars are sitting there with the Conrods and oil paint and oil all over the floor. And uh, it was, I think it was eight cars that got wrecked like that. And then uh, we went over to our car and he hadn't touched it because we disconnected the battery and he couldn't start it. So that was a, a kind of a, a unique thing that happened, you know. How many people know about that? Yeah, well, Carol Shelby is a, is a great guy to work for. He's a, a really, uh, really uh, good with a man. I mean, he, he, his, his talent was to gather up all these individuals that had special talents, like Phil Remington, the chief mechanic, uh, and Charlie Agafu, John Collins, uh, Bill Eaton, all those guys that were fabrication experts or welding experts. He pulled them all together, and, and together there were a lot of hot rod people back in the 60s and uh, pulled them all together and they, uh, they achieved what he was trying to do. I mean, uh, I mean, and there were some wild times too, you know. Uh, I remember in Daytona once, uh, we, we pulled into Daytona to race and we were given a hotel room and, and uh, we're all sitting around talking. And then uh, I was sitting on the bed, it was in my room actually, we were sitting around talking and uh, Ricky Nelson walked in, we called him Ricky Nelson, his name was Gordon Chance, he's actually from Canada, he was the teenage tuner, he'd do all that carburetion work on it, the changing the F11 tubes and stuff that were in the carburetor, on the Webbers. And he walked in the room and he, he sat down next to me and he opened, opened the drawer and I didn't see what he did, he shut the drawer and, and uh, he walked back out and, and the next thing that bloody... Uh, uh, nightstand blew into smithereens. Boom! He put an M80 in there and it blew up and the smoke poured out of the room and everybody cleared out and ran down. The next thing the manager comes running down and he said, what the hell happened here, you know? And, and uh, he said, oh, I'm going to have to tell Shelby, you know. So Shelby comes down and he looks in the, in the door and he said, ah, oh, he said, the boys are going to have their fun. Put it on my bill. <laughs> so that's what he's like. <laughs> oh, it was the camaraderie the, together with something else with the people, you know, with the, with the mechanics and stuff, you know. Jesus, uh, unbelievable. But you know, we, we you know, back in those days, you didn't sort of think much about that. I mean, I didn't even have a box baby Kramer to take photos, you know. I mean, uh, Christ, we, we, I get one story, when we went up to, uh, went to France one time, and we, we, we wanted to go to see the Eiffel Tower, see? So we're driving through France, park the car, and get, get out of the car, get into the bottom of the Eiffel Tower, and there's a, a guy with a big crisscross gate, steel gates. We jumped in the, into the thing, paid our $7.50, went up to the first level, we get out of the car, and the guy on the other side says, we're ready to go. And I thought it was the next thing. We jumped in the car and went straight down to the bottom again. And then we tried to get our money back and they kicked us out. You know? So that's just one story that happened. The Mechanics Hall of Fame uh, for Sturdivant Trophy for building the uh, GT40 that Ken Miles won Sebring with in 66. That was the one with the open top. You know, it was, it was only one of the ones that was built with an aluminum body and it, had, it was a roadster. So that's why I won the Mechanics Hall of Fame trophy for that. And, that. and yeah. then the Daytona Coupes we run at Sebring and all over the place. I was, I was crew chief on those too. The car behind me is a Daytona Coupe. Uh, it's, uh, this particular one is a replica of the car that we ran at uh, all the different places, Seabrig, Daytona, and uh, at Le Mans. Uh, the difference, the main difference is the car that was originally uh, built on a 289 chassis, which has three inch main tubes, but this has a, a cage or a crisscut network of three quarter inch tubes that go along the top of the chassis, they come up over the transmission, and it stiffens up the chassis a lot. Now this the original car was built by, by uh, John Collins, I mean uh, John Olson, he was a New Zealander, 
And they built, they took a roadster and took the body off it and uh, put it on a couple of jack stands and built the, the Daytona Coupe. Pete Brock was the designer on it and he worked in conjunction with, uh, uh, what's his name, Phil Remington, who was the chief engineer. And they designed this car and, and the thing ran real fast. They run damn near 200 miles an hour, they 198 or something in the, and the roadsters couldn't go that quick. So uh, first of all, when uh, Pete Brock designed this, nobody in the shop wanted the thing. They hated it. Nobody had even worked on it. And then when they went out and tested it and they find out it run pretty good, then everybody wanted to get involved. Four of these cars built at, at Went the Mons, and I was put on as a crew chief on, on, on one of them. And uh, a crew chief have to, uh, what we do, we were given the basic car with no wiring or motor or transmission or suspension in it. So we had to build all the suspension, uh, the A-frames, put in the bushes on those, uh, mount the motor, we had to make the engine mounts to mount the motor, put in the headers and stuff. We had to put in the quick jacks on it because uh, when they come in for a pit stop, they had these little air jacks, you punked the airline into it and it lifted the whole car off the ground. We changed the wheels and tires and then set them down again and away we go on the, on the, on the yeah, race again. Yeah. The suspension was the same as the roadster, but what we had to do when we were given the car was sort of like a basic kit and each crew chief had to be responsible to assemble that whole car, install the motor engine, all the wiring, uh, do all the detail work, make the aluminum panels that fit inside the body and finish the car off. They went over to paint and a guy called Dennis Ersick, uh, he's since passed on, but he did all the painting on the cars and uh, then they'd come back to us and we'd do the final assembly. And then we were responsible for that car as it went overseas uh, to, to any race it went, to Daytona, Sebring or whatever. And then there was different drivers, like Dan Gurney drove for me on one of my cars at, at Sebring and then his head hit, head kept hitting the, the roof because he was too tall, so we had to make a little bubble. It beat out a bubble on a, on a, a jackhammer thing and then pop riveted it on so his helmet wouldn't keep hitting the top. I'll tell you one thing that happened that was, was scary. at, at uh, Daytona, um, Dan Gurney came in and he, he said, I've got trouble with the uh, sway bar or something not right on the car. He said, why don't you jump in and see what you think? You know, so I jumped in onto the, into the passenger side, slid down under the seat and we took off around Daytona. We were doing 160 mile an hour. I got into that bank and I couldn't believe it. My guts went down like this. My arm, I couldn't lift my arms up and, and you couldn't see a hundred feet in front of you. It was just a black wall and that, and it was scary as hell. At any rate, Shelby heard out, heard that I was in the car and he come running out onto the pits with a, with a knockoff hammer and he's shaking it at Gurney, he said, get your ass in here. <laughs> and then we come, we got ripped there. He got ripped up for that. Uh, so in here in all different colors and shapes and, uh, you know, I mean, the little stuff like, for instance, the, the, all the, the stripes on the car, are supposed to be two stripes, seven inches wide with a one inch in the middle. And I mean, uh, there's, there's all different widths and sizes and shapes and colors. The hood scoops were all, like if you'll notice on, on the black car that, that I was in, the, the, there's a, a row of pop rivets around the front of the hood. Uh, the, the hood scoop was pop riveted on. A lot of these are glassed in, which looks nice today, but it wasn't the way it was. And those pop rivets, the reason they're, they're there is that we went to a race at one time and uh, the skin on the front of the hood started to lift and the air got underneath it. So they pulled the car in at the race and Phil Remington got over, over there with, a, pop, with a, a drill and a pop rivet gun and he pop riveted onto the three quarter bar that was in underneath. And then from then on, they all had to have this pop rivets in, even though uh, it was only one case that actually caused it. Another thing you'll notice on these cars, some of them have flares on the back fender. Well, we went to race in Pensacola once and we want to try some wider uh, Goodyear tires, the, uh, the slicks, the, they had the sort of a square edge instead of the round edge on them. So they went out and the damn tires were hitting the fender and causing smoke and burning up. So Remington jumps over the wall with a pair of vice grips and he pulls the lip out all the way around the thing, sent them out to run. And then uh, from then on, all the cars had to have, they went back to the shop and they smoothed it out. And from then on, all the cars, the first 50 cars were like that and we smoothed it out and run them that way. Then they called the factory and they said, we want two inch strip in each fender, right in the top of the fender, just to widen the car out so that we can handle these bigger tires. So that's the reason you see two different models here. Some of them have the lip, some of them don't. But if you actually measure the outside of the lip, 
they're both the same, like 70 inches. Yeah, that's right. It's, it's not really my design. This was designed by a guy called Ar Steve Arns, originally, back in the 70s. And he was the one that came up with the concept. He's probably one of the first guys that built a replica Cobra, uh, as far as I know he was. And uh, he was a bad businessman, and uh, he got selling kits and got the money for it and then didn't give him the parts, back ordered everything. So then he went bankrupt and uh, the people came to me because I was building the, the roll cage assembly and stuff that went in the car. I was building that and the people come to me to get the rest of the stuff to finish the car. So I did that for about a couple of years and then they come to me and ask me if I would build the whole car. So then I remade all the jigs off, an, off one of his chassis and then built them again and started off from scratch. But I fixed all the little problems that I had. One fender was too high and the the the, the Wheelbase was a little bit out and stuff like that, you know. So we we changed them to the to the better.